Hello, my name is Lynn Kronberger and I'm the Chief Development Officer here at WAMU. As a public media organization, our mission is to connect listeners and members like you around the world. Public radio works because listeners and members who value this service step up and give back. Support from listeners and members is not only our most reliable and important source of funding, it's also our largest source of funding. Thank you for your support of the Diane Ring Book Club. If you have been enjoying this monthly virtual book club and want to make a gift to support this event series and keep it going, you can give at dianereem.org slash give. We are grateful for the 462 people who have registered today to join us. This event is being recorded and closed caption is available. Just click the button on the bottom of your screen. And now let us start the discussion with the host of our book club, Diane Reem. Thank you, Lynn. And welcome to the May meeting of our virtual book club. Today, we discuss the Children Act by award-winning British author Ian McEwan. The 2014 novel tells the story of a boy who refuses life-saving treatment because of his beliefs. This sets up a clash between law and religion that must be decided by a family court judge and raises questions about the role of the state in raising children. Joining me today, Naomi Khan, professor of law and co-director of the Family Law Center at the University of Virginia. Nathan Hensley, Associate Professor of English at Georgetown University, and Barry Hardiman, Senior Editor at NPR. We'll be taking your questions throughout our discussion. You can type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to just as many as we can. We've already heard from a number of you, and we'll try to include those as well. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being with. Hi there. So nice to be here, Diane. Thanks for Thank having us. Thank you. Thank you. This is actually two stories, isn't it? It's the story of a young boy, Adam, who is with his family deeply involved with the Church of Jehovah's Witness. He needs desperately a blood transfusion in order to stay alive. And the doctors have said to the court, to the family, to the boy, that unless he has that blood transfusion, he will likely die the next day. It's also the story of the judge, Fiona, and her husband, who has knocked her off her socks by declaring he wants a divorce that he's tired of living the life they're living and he's going to leave. He's in love with another woman. Obviously, the story of the boy and his life takes precedence here. But first of all, I'm wondering what each of you thought of this book. Let me start with you, Nathan. I, I loved reading this book. It's a strange book and a really uh, interesting one to read. And I have to admit that um, 
that when I began the book, I didn't expect it to go the way that it did. And so I, I was really pleased to see the plot, which starts off, I thought, um, maybe a little schematically setting up these sort of tensions between, um, between you know, faith and the state in a somewhat sort of schematic way, or it seems like a real black and white kind of um, setup, and it gets very tangled and odd. And I really enjoyed that as the as the book went on. And I, I think I agree with you that the two plots are come together uh, in a very odd way in a plot point that I'm sure we'll talk about um, as the discussion proceeds. But but the sort of way that the plot the sort of plot develops and builds on itself and gets much weirder than it seems like it might at the beginning, uh, I, I really enjoyed. So it was and his prose is always such a pleasure, which I hope we get to talk about too. And Naomi, what about you? How did you feel about it considering the epigraph, which I'd really love for you to read for us? I'm, I will start with the epigraph, which All right. is from the Children Act, the 1989 British legislation against which that that second plot, the story of Henry, uh, the story of Adam Henry is takes place. And the 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 Children Act, and also the Children Act, of course, is how McEwen gets the title. Lots of people say the Children's Act, but it's actually titled the Children Act. And it starts section one is welfare of the child when a court determines any question with respect to the upbringing of a child, the child's welfare shall be the court's paramount consideration. That's how McEwen starts the book. There's also a little bit more just in that first section of the Children Act that I think it's worth reciting just because it's so relevant to the story. Good. And so the Children Act continues in any proceeding in which any question with respect to the upbringing of a child arises, the court shall have regard to the general principle that any delay in determining the question is likely to prejudice the welfare of the child. Hmm. Particularly when we're dealing with a blood transfusion that's necessary to keep Adam Henry alive, that second clause seems very important. So how did you, reading the book, feel that epigraph sort of set the scene for the entire book. There's obviously a great deal of urgency in the case that the judge must decide. It's a question of whether this boy will be alive within a week. And so that 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 part of the Children Act, the the at the epigraph of the book, it so clearly relates to the upbringing of the child to his very life. And the whole, the process of deciding his case occurs, has to occur so quickly it, without any delay in the words of the act. Mm -hmm. And so the, the plot in that part has to move along quite quickly. So I, I thought it really, I, I thought his, McEwen's use of British law at the beginning, given that there is this incredibly strong plot about the judge's role as a judge and the role of the law in these incredibly complicated issues was just spellbinding and so absorbing. Good. Barry, how about you? What, what was your reaction to this somewhat almost magical <laughs> young man? I mean, uh, Adam is so special. Yes, and you can, and he needs to be in order to be the inciting character of this book to knock Fiona off her feet. You know, I, I one of the things that's so, um, that is so, I just try, I'm sorry, I just heard a, something in my ear. Okay. It's all right. No, okay, good. Um, so one of the things that I think is so special about this book is that, you know, it, it looks like it's going to be a kind of um, the normal, like, or a structure that you might expect. You know, there's a, there's, you know, he comes along and he sets her off and then she has to make a decision and then we're all going to learn something at the end. But it's not really, 
the the real relationship with Adam doesn't happen until sort of somewhat through the book. And it, this, I think, is one of the things that's so, um, you know, McEwen is so facile with shaping books in a way that you might not expect. You know, it's very, very, you know, you're in the hands of a master the entire time. And I actually, this is one of the things I really happen to like prefer, to prefer. I know everyone loves atonement. I love atonement. I'm not a monster, but I will say I, <laughs> I happen to prefer his short novels because I think they show they show us what a novel can do with structure as much as it can do with its ideas and how the structure and the ideas can um, come together. Because I think without the way that this book is told, you would get a slightly less nuanced book about the role of religion, the role of law, and the role of, of each other in our lives. Um, so, so yes, I adored, I, I adored Adam Henry. I felt for him, I felt for her, I felt for Jack. I, you know, I, I had, I, I, it was, you know, these are all people who, who were odd enough to feel like real life, you know. Jack being Fiona's husband, Indeed. who has announced to her in the first few pages yeah. of the book that yeah. he's leaving her. Yeah. Um, I think that um, she is such a carefully drawn character with um, such a careful mind. And it's reflected in the tightness of Ian McEwan's writing. Nathan, there's almost not a spare word to be had. In yeah, it's novel. it's really gorgeous in that way, isn't it? The way that it's so tightly honed and careful, as you say. And, you know, McEwen's writing has um, been praised and critiqued as being clinical and cold or detached. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that you can see him playing with that technique here, because I think what we see with Fiona as the book proceeds is really the idea of a kind of mind that's attuned towards a kind of clinical dispassionate judgment, you know, with the law and meaning to needing to sort of have that removed from, um, you know, what she calls sort of um, sentimental traps, you know, she initially doesn't want to visit the hospital because she thinks that would be just, it would ruin the sort of dispassion of her judgment. And so there's this kind of idea of a clinical remove that as the book proceeds, I mean, I was, this is the part where I was skeptical, but as the book proceeds, we start just opening up a little wedge of irony to see what that kind of clinical and removed persona um, that is outside of the body entirely um, kind of leaves out or what it's mm -hmm. unable to kind of apprehend about human relationships. And I think that's the part where for me, the technique of the novel becomes very complicated. It's broken into five acts. It's so structured, you know, as, as Barry was just describing. So that's a really neat thing for me. Yes. And before we move to the hospital, which for me is such an extraordinary uh, scene, um, let's talk about Adam and his parents who are so deeply involved with Jehovah's Witness. And Adam has been raised to believe that everything his parents tell him and the elders tell him is absolute truth and the word that must be followed, Naomi. Um, he is, he's, the, this whole concept of closed worlds comes out so mm -hmm. vividly, uh, to some extent, Nathan was just referring to that in, in the context of the sort of cold and dispassionate way in which one needs to approach the law if one is a judge, but there's so many distinct world, so many distinct closed worlds. The law is a closed world. The Jehovah's Witness world as a closed world. The other 
and, and there's, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, but there's wonderful foreshadowing of the decision in Adam's case with respect to the other cases that she decides. But in each of them, religion is depicted as representing a somewhat closed world for the people who are within it. Now, Adam claims that he can see the nature of this closed world. It is his closed world. It is his choice. And I think that's, of course, one of the natures, those of us who, who know we are in closed worlds always feel as though that is our world, that is our reality. And Barry, uh, that closed world is very much fortified by his parents. We don't hear too much about them, except that they are totally totally in favor of refusing a blood transfusion. That's right. And if I were to make a petty complaint about a book that I think is fabulous, um, I, I would say that this is the one, you know, he's done such, he does such a wonderful uh, job depicting that closed world of the, the legal system, right? The, you know, the sort of the digressions into, um, you know, different cases from the, the salt marshes to the family, all of these different things. The world that he, he does not actually animate with the same care is, I think, the world of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I, and I, and I, and for a, an author who is, you know, renowned and clearly does his research quite well, I felt, I wonder if, you know, and remember, Ian McEwen is, you know, quite well known as, you know, an avowed atheist. He's one of the Richard Dawkins crew. I almost wondered if that was a failure on his part because he he actually couldn't become animated by it by it himself. Do you know what I'm saying? Huh. There was a kind of um I I I I wanted I wanted that Adam's family and that world to get the same treatment as the legal system. You know do you mean you wanted to learn more? Yes. Yes, I, yes, Jehovah's Witness. Absolutely, I wanted, um, I wanted them to have their own. I wanted to feel uh, the decision she was making, not ju not just from Adam's point of view, but also more, also from the parents, and then also, you know, I mean, one of the things that's so brilliant about the book is it is in this very close third. You know, we're essentially in Fiona's um, head the whole time, which is incredibly hard to do and is a thing that he is particularly good at. Um, but I, I think I would have liked to, I would have liked to have an understanding of the world that Adam oh. is in, in, a, in, and I don't know. And, and I think it's just, it's sort of, a, it's a loss because I, you know, he does such a marvelous job with, again, the other closed worlds, but again, but, but that said, you know, I, I, for a an author that I, you know, I remember when I first read this book years ago, I thought, well, this is going to be a screed against religion, you know, because I know who he is, you know, I know That's what, what he, I thought, too. Didn't you? Yes. Yeah. And, and I was and so so, you know, on the other hand, I was actually quite impressed that it it wasn't it is about a search for meaning. It is yeah. about what religion can do for us, but it is more important about what we can do for each other. And I thought, and so, and so I forgive him the kind of the, 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 the <laughs> details that I felt were missing in that, in that world. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's, uh, it's Diane, do you mind if I, I, there's something really interesting about that to you, because I think that there, um, I noticed something similar and, you know, the book has been described and kind of in its like five act structure um, and in its sort of reason versus, um, you know, secular reason versus faith set up, it asks to be read as a kind of tragedy where there's a, con where, where it's sort of what happens is you have a conflict of two equally valid mm -hmm. claims and that what issues as in Antigone or something is a kind of right. tragedy that comes, but no one's really to blame. And, and, and there, that only works if both of those are equally fleshed out and made to feel valid. And I think that when we have later in the book, someone says, it's why replace one tooth fairy story with another tooth fairy story. And, th and that that's in the voice of the character. It's not the narrator or anything, but, but I do think that there's some sense in which the, the experience of religiosity, if you want, is kind of a little bit hollowed out and seen from the outside here. And it's interesting. I don't know if others noticed this, but to me, I thought that the communal experience that was so vividly felt was really 
uh, maybe it'll come up later, but music, the, the oh, sort of set, 100%. like, like yes. the sort of secular religions of music and poetry and, yes. and, you know, the novel itself seem to stand in for that and are, are actually amazingly evoked as, as sensory experiences, you know? Naomi? I actually felt very, you said you didn't think it was a screed against religion. I think it's a subtle screed against religion in every single one of the cases that the judge decides that involving religion, it is, there, there's, there's the case of the Haredi Jewish mother who wants to still keep her children in religion, um, just not in as a, a rigid part of the religion as what the, the father wants. But religion is often seen as preventing the growth of children and preventing natural development, preventing them from having life and love. And as Fiona keeps saying to, to Adam, all that, all that, that childhood and all of the promise of life. And so religion is very consistently, I think, seen as holding back the, the, people in the, in the case, in, in, the, in the judgments. And, and on the other hand, there is, I mean, the secular religions of the law, of music, the, and then the community that we see with all of the other barristers where there's that, that Christmas recital. I mean, there are yeah. different forms of community Indeed. that seem to be celebrated. So as Fiona sits on the bench, trying to weigh the argument in this really very important case of life or death. She makes the very personal decision, Nathan, as you referred to, to go to the hospital to visit Adam. Um, how did you feel about and and confined your remarks to just the decision to go to visit Adam? What was your reaction, Naomi? Did you think she shouldn't have done this or it was okay for her to do this? How did you feel about that? I think in the book, it's recognized as being highly unusual, but my understanding, and again, the author did incredible research. I think in the actual case on which this is based, her friend, the, the judge who had been one of the, the deciders in the case actually went to the hospital to visit the child in the case. And so recognizing that it's unusual the, the other thing that it does is the, the child in, in many proceedings involving children, you can think of divorce and child custody, for example, it's, it's quite, and obviously this is a different context, but it's relatively rare for the child to have an actual voice in the proceedings. And one of the things that her visit to the hospital does is, though it's not in an open court, and, and often, of course, it's not appropriate to hear children in open court, but, it, but, but what happens is the judge actually gets to hear from the child. The, 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 the social worker is, is sitting there. It's, it's not a, a private judicial conference, but going to the hospital allows the judge to make her own decisions about Adam's maturity, the sincerity of his beliefs in what he's doing. And so it seemed, although unusual, completely appropriate to actually hear from Interesting. The it actually, I thought, humanized mm. Fiona yes. in a way yes. that perhaps I hadn't expected. Um, Adam is so frail. He is quite, quite, quite as though 
there's almost no blood flowing through his body. And before she leaves, he pulls out <laughs> his prized possession. He pulls out his violin. And here Fiona puts her hands around this lovely musical instrument of which Adam is so proud. And he says he'd like to play. Or I've forgotten whether she asks him to play or he volunteers to play. In any case, he volunteers, he plays, and we have an excerpt of a beautiful rendition of the piece he begins to play, and Fiona, who has quite a lovely voice, begins to sing with him. May we hear that, please? rendition. It's with a harp in the background and not a violin, but somehow the moment is so extraordinarily important in both their lives, Barry. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's so this turning point is that it both of them have there's a feeling of freedom, right, that happens for both of them. She is, um, you know, you have been inside this sort of cold mechanical, the problems in her domestic life, you know, you've the chip, 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 chip top of her life in this the highly secular, you know, and and when, you know, she is able to see him and and when they connect over this other world of music, this other religiosity, both of them sort of find freedom. And both of them are thrown into chaos as a result. You know, I mean, she suddenly is, you know, deeply, it, it, it really sort of throws her off her, uh, you know, off her, off her hinges a little bit. And the same happens for him. And so there is this kind of thing about that moment, which is one of those things that feels like a real, a, like a, a triumph of the author's uh, imagination rather than even being, but still feels realistic, you know what I mean? I, it's almost unbelievable the, it is, it, you know, he is so beautiful, so pale, the sort of the Blakeian poetry, the this and the that, and it could be maudlin. But I think that because the, that, that this moment of like, of, of just incredible intellectual, emotional freedom that happens for both of them, because it isn't played for, what might be corny, like then everybody goes and lives happily ever after. I think it's why it works for me, you know, because it because it could be it could be maudlin, you know. But instead, we because he he really animates it in this way that is, I think, so so interesting. And we've come to know Fiona at that point. We've come to like her. We've come exactly. to exactly. And so we've come to know that she is, you know, a a bastion of moral probity, <laughs> and also, and also 
you know, a, a warm emotional person so that when we get the, the, the several pages of her opinion, we know where it came from, but the consequences are, 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 are intense for both of them. And so Nathan, she goes back to the court at, I think, 9.30 at night, which is unthinkable. And everybody is waiting for her decision and out it comes. Yeah, and it's it's an it's a moment of it's the first moment besides this this amazing connection over music that's a genuine surprise in the book because you of course think that what's happening is that she's now discovered as she says at, to Adam in the hospital I'm sure that you know your own mind I'm convinced that you know your own mind and then she goes back and deliberates and kind of gets away from what the book calls her impulsive connection with Adam and has a chance to think it over in her home and comes back and says that he must be protected from his religion and from himself. And so, um, in other words, finds, finds that he will be treated against his will. And so I think that's one of the, or one of the moments where you realize that this book is actually much more up to something much trickier than I at least first thought. And I think that's really neat because we, what, what actually is, is moving Fiona in all of this because she's just been transported we believed fully into this other realm of connection with Adam into a sympathetic moment which happens a lot in the Victorian novels that the that the book is constantly alluding to um, these moments of sympathy where two characters that don't have a lot in common come together and often stringed music plays in the background you imagine um, and then they make up their differences but that actually doesn't happen here and, and it and it goes off in a different direction which is I think to the book's immense credit, and I think makes it a lot um, more uh, slippery than I certainly expected at first. Naomi, yeah, I'm I'm interested in why Nathan, you you talk about how it's it's more slippery than than you expected, because it it seems. I mean, yes, here we have there, there are different principles that she's handling. She's got to deal with this is. He's throughout the book. We I think that the number of times that we learn he's what seventeen and nine months. He's <laughs> almost at the age yeah. of majority. In three months, he'll be able Teetering to. On the as brink. we all are, sorry, teetering on the brink. They are yes, yes, right. yes. yeah. Um, he'll be able to make his own <laughs> and his own decisions concerning medical treatment, which which of course he does. Um, uh, later, so so he's teetering right. He's teetering on the brink. <laughs> Um, Gary says uh, he's so we, we have a, a quite mature minor or so it seems from that exchange in the hospital room where she really does seem to respect him where there is that bonding over music so, so we have that then we have the language from the children act so we have the law coming in then we have the 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 parents who do have control Oh, in general, over the meta, over decisions concerning the medical treatment of their child, and then we have, you know, the 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 the, the actual what's going on in in the hospital, that the cold and sterile hospital room coming back in and kind of forming the backdrop for for all of these bonds. So we have all of that sort of coming together in this judgment, and um. Uh, I, I guess so. So, which which gets me back to my question of you know just just why were you so surprised? Was it the fact that she had found him to be a mature minor, and then McEwen kind of says, nonetheless, she's going to hew closely to this idea that the court should be making a decision that is in the child's best interest, even if that's not how the child and the parents define it, or the physicians for that matter. So that's, yeah, so that, that, that's yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I'd be interested to hear what others think. I mean, from my perspective, it's just that she literally contradicts herself um, in the sense that she comes to this realization when she's presented with this sort of moment of sympathetic encounter with Adam that you do, you know, your own mind. I do believe you. And you were led to believe that they share this connection um, that would seem in a kind of more sentimental novel to transcend differences across mm -hmm. barriers. Uh, but she reasserts the differences and says, no, actually, you're you're a minor and you're a ward of the court and you're going to your body is the territory of the laws 
power. And, um, and that's the decision. And so I think that there's a, you realize that there's something animating Fiona's fidelity to this um, remove, if you want, like that there's almost a kind of religious conviction in her detachment um, and, and that it's a form of denial or refusal or whatever. In other words, that it's almost as embodied and almost like quasi eroticized as some of these other um, mm -hmm attachments that she that we read about in the novel that are sort of pathologized or rendered weird um from the exactly. book's point of view so i like that reversal and i think that shows it to be you know a, a more interesting read than like an op-ed by ian McEwen, for example about secularism right. well, <laughs> and barry I, alluded to that before right well if you you know the thing that is so her reasserting of that part of herself you know and after she's had this this experience where it's sort of the separation, which to her has always been kind of straightforward between her uh, her private self and her the function she has as a public um, executor of the law or whatever, when that begins to break down and she sees, you know, despite her fidelity to this, it's really, that is when the sort of, you know, that's when she's really thrown into this sort of, into the self-doubt. And I think it has, the, it, the consequences are, so intense because in terms of the decisions that she makes later on. Well, you know. one of uh, the immediate consequences is that Fiona receives a letter from Adam. And this letter, in a sense, shows both how mature and immature he really is. Um, there's a yearning. He's pouring his heart out to her. Um, so much so that she can't bear it. I think she cannot bear the deeply personal connection that she feels. So she does not respond to his letter. Instead, she goes off to a conference of other judges. And she hears several cases during this period. But what happens but Adam? follows her. He finds out where she is, where she's going to be. And she's sitting at dinner with the other judges and their guests. And she is informed by the butler that there is something she must attend to. She goes to the door and there is Adam, totally drenched from the pouring rain. And I'm eating my heart out for this <laughs> young boy. I really am, though I know yeah. he has overstepped his bounds. And she knows it well. And what does she do, Nathan? I mean, it's an amazing, it's an amazing moment. And I, as you were describing it, Diane, I was thinking about all of the remakes of Pride and Prejudice, you know, the Jane Austen movies where the, the <laughs> male character is always wet. It's wet. And somehow that, <laughs> somehow being drenched in water produces a kind of um, strange fireworks. But, um, but yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's a really odd, it's a really odd moment because it's another place where the book, I think, kind of goes, just keeps going into stranger territory. Right. Because, um, Fiona has uh, an encounter with him where she's trying to get him to leave, but he doesn't want to leave. He wants to kind of want, he, he suggests that he wants to move in with her, but as a kind of child, like with her and her husband. And so this is a place for me where her, um, we haven't talked about her kind of like allegedly failed status as a mother in the book, oh, um, which I didn't love, but I think is important to how the book is organized, um, that, she, that she has this kind of like, incredibly ambiguous relationship to Adam, again, related to his 17.9 years of age or whatever, where is she <laughs> a mother figure to him or is this an erotic encounter? And they have this like 
incredibly ambiguous, structurally irresolvable kiss um, while he's wet in this lobby. Um, and she, I looked at it again before we talked, it's on my page 174, but, but he starts to talk and she raises a hand and it says to shush him. Like in a, in a, I read that as a kind of maternal gesture. Mm -hmm. um, and then she means to lean in to say something to him, but it's like, there's no, no one decides to do it, but their faces, their lips met. And so there's a kind of disembodied quality to this and ambiguous quality to what happens, but what happens is they kiss. So there's more to say about that, but I'm eager to hear what other people thought of this quite astonishing uh, twist in the plot. And that kiss becomes, even though it was barely a kiss, it becomes so embedded in Fiona's mind, Naomi. It, it does, and it's something that she keeps obsessing over, that she's worried, that she's overstepped the bounds of judicial ethics in doing it, that in, in that same scene that, that Nathan was just describing, where she's worried that the clerk saw them, that she'll be hauled up before some judicial commission. But then it also comes back in the ending scene with Jack, where his, she, she, she I, I, McEwen handles that so nicely when he talks about the sexual double standard. And when Jack feels incredible, you, you can tell incredible jealousy that there was this kiss. And it is, as you said, Diane, so ambiguous as to just what precisely happened there. The, the other thing that's that's going on, and, and of course I, I teach in law school classrooms, and one of the things we, we teach are these very carefully digested cases. They start and end, they take about five pages. But that's also of course how we think about the law. When you're a judge, the parties are before you. You say, okay, and, and obviously when she's deciding these cases, she's incredibly involved. But at the end, the parties go away. And in the case involving child abduction early in the book, she says, you know, I would probably never see these people again. The, the next proceeding would be in some other court, probably in Morocco. And so, so one of the things that Adam following her, I mean, continuing to write to her and following her, and then this ambiguous kiss is, it shows you that the people in court decisions are people. And so there's, there's also a power to that as it shakes her. And that is where one of our listeners has a perfectly timed question. Mm. Can you discuss the juxtaposition of Fiona's judgment that Adam should step outside the bounds of his Jehovah's Witness mm. religion to receive the transfusion while simultaneously not being receptive whatsoever to Jack's request to step outside the bounds of marriage for a physical affair, even though Jack remains deeply in love with Fiona Barry. Well, there are many, many uh, juxtapositions in this novel of what people are asking of each other in terms of their well-ordered worlds, right? And, you know, it's funny, I thought that, I, I, I thought that the end of that question was going to be the comparison between uh, her decision and Adam asking her to step outside the bounds and sort of take him in to her life as a mother figure exactly. or whatever. But it's so, but what an interesting thing our our, li, our listener has has pointed out because this idea of like, of what do we, you know, what do we owe each other when we, when we, you know, start to disrupt, you know, these systems that we are all, you know, uh, part of. that we're all part of in some, in some way. Now, one thing about that, I actually, it's funny and Nathan, you alerted, alluded to this and I'd be interested to see more what you um the the fact that the of jack's um uh proposal uh is kind of one of, like i i i thought this is one of these moments where i thought he wrote in a in a 
in a really precise way about what it is like to be a, a incredibly intelligent and competent woman of a certain age who is making all of these very, um, you know, complicated legal judgments and is just ferociously comp competent, right? But is also being sort of privately humiliated <laughs> at the same time. And, um, and I think that that sort of, you know, and, and betrayed, humiliated and betrayed. And, there, and, and, and yet I am uncomfortable with the way that he writes about her, the, her childness, which I think is handled in a kind of like, it doesn't feel, uh, I just, I, I, it, what, it didn't, that was the one where I, it, that gave me, it made me feel a little bit squidgy, despite the fact that I think he does do so well with this sort of, you know, the, the private hum humiliations of a competent woman, you know? Nathan? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, Barry. I think that there's a, there's a way where it, it, it edges so close to cliche when it's, mm -hmm. um, when it's treating this archetype of the sort of hyper competent professional woman who then is therefore by virtue of that closed off from having a full erotic life, which is then held to be isomorphic with like not having a family as, as it felt to her as this kind of lack that goes on through the book that Adam steps in again, ambiguously to fill. So I, th I think there, I, I was eager to ask, um, people who aren't in, in my body, what it, what the writing from inside a uh, professional woman's point of view felt like, because um, I thought there's this kind of incredible, like clinical taxonomic accuracy of thinking about, for example, aging, mm -hmm. you know, gu the gums that are receding in millimeters yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, a kind of um, the fungal toes and, you know, this sort of strange details that are incredibly vivid. And, and that one's pretty gross actually, but, um, <laughs> but, there, but it, it adds, it adds up to a sort of um, a kind of like prose of embodiment, if you want, like, it's really good about thinking about bodies. And I don't know if it, how it felt to you to have Fiona described almost as um, an almost like de-eroticized or desiccated body in that way, you know, it, that changes as the book goes on, but I don't know if that yeah. rings with how you all felt. Naomi? Well, oh, I, 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 I it's, McEwen seemed, there, there were times when she recalled her wild childhood adventures in Newcastle, her yep. early days with Jack, which kind of set her up as certainly being erotic uh, and, yeah. and feeling, feeling incredible sexual attraction. And then you're, you're right, that juxtaposition. I, I did feel the, the, the professional woman who just keeps running out of time. That that mm -hmm. part felt quite cliched compared with the clinical nature of, of his descriptions, right, of, of what it's like to grow old. Um, and then there's, there's the warmth that they both feel when the nieces and nephews, I mean, that also yeah. felt a little sort of odd and tacked on, but but there seems to be throughout, nonetheless, this longing for children with the nieces and nephews and how much fun they have. Yes, the and, it is, and it is literally her job, which de-eroticizes it because she's had this experience with, with the conjoined twins. It is literally yeah. her professional life has drained her of that. And that's where I'm like, come on. But I know he needs her to be like, this is where, you know, this whole thing is winding in and out of, is it an allegory or is it a novel about people, right? And this is the, it, that winding, you know, there, he needs her to be sort of empty of those urges so that she can be reanimated by Adam, right? Yeah. You know, and so, you know, and that's problematic. It's interesting to think about and read, but it, it's a little problematic. So there's a question from Mary. In the end, she said, how would you describe Jack and Fiona's relationship? Are they reconciled? They might not have passion, but do they have something else? What's your guess, Nathan? I, that's a great question because it's something the book leaves open-ended to a degree. And I think I was looking back over it, you know, before we were going to chat and it, it really struck me that what she says at the end of the book, is this giving it too much away, but I think it's no, worth no, no. answering the question. But mm -hmm. what, um, what she says, at the, what, what the book tells us at the end is that she 
asks, would Jack still love her if she tells him the whole story? And then the book ends with her telling him the story and then it's over. And so what's really interesting to me about that is that Fiona, the, the lifelong judge, is turned into um, a, a witness and w she awaits judgment. I mean, she's giving a kind of testimony and she's vulnerable before judgment. And the book actually like holds us, that's just white space at the end. We don't know what does he or doesn't he, how does he respond? He, he says it was impossible for him to know in advance what he would think, but then they go forward. And so I thought that was actually a really interesting way of bringing the whole thing to a sort of pseudo closure. Um, because well, it's such a moment of vulnerability, right? There's one closure we haven't talked about, Barry, and that is what Fiona learns during this Christmas concert mm -hmm. that she and a colleague give. It's an annual event, and people really enjoy it all the colleagues come together and the colleague has a beautiful is it baritone or tenor voice tenor. and tenor. she plays the piano gorgeously she's had a few drinks <laughs> beforehand and indeed, she feels that the drinks have kind of loosened her up and allowed her to be play beautifully. But then she finds out, Barry. That Adam um, has gone, gone back to, uh, having failed him, he has gone back to this other world and is dead. And yeah. He has refused mm -hmm. the transfusion. More specifically, yes, I should. <laughs> yes, he has refused the transfusion, and having having gone back, having been rejected by her, and um and and is dead. And and the juxtaposition of it's funny. There are so many places in this book where the music, you know, the music in the hospital and then the music at the end. And then there's this sort of the, that moment with the kiss, there are these, these, again, these particular, um, you know, moments of action. And this one, you know, you know, you are in the hands of the, you are in the grip of the climax, right? When you're reading it. Um, and, and, and I think what actually worked for me about it was that was that it felt it was one of these things where it felt both completely impossible that you would have that 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 of course that during that she would be having this very very close experience with the music when she you know really uh knows this but it also felt exactly it also felt kind of real you know when she rushes out and the moment when there when she says oh they'll just think that uh, that she was particularly moved by the um by the the concert and and it's funny because that's where again McEwen very is very deft, despite the fact that he is using a, uh, a a set piece that that could be kind of a cliche. You know, I mean, he he is this whole book. He is just like moguls with the cliches. Does it quite? <laughs> yeah, he's so close. Um, but it, it but it's also a but it's a gorgeous moment. And it's and again like the right. This is a thing I must say. The writing about um, the when the singing in the hospital and the performance um, at the end and the Berlioz and the Mahler and the I mean that is so effective and so he's done this before in Amsterdam I mean he knows how to write about music but it is so effect it is as effective as his writing as a legal argument you know what I mean it's so amazing. you're yeah. left with the question, did Adam really want to die or did he want to hurt the person who had rejected him? Did he want Fiona to feel his death as her responsibility because she would not take him into her home. And 
thereby leave her with a feeling of guilt for the rest of her life. Naomi? I think that he, it, it, th that's another, there's, there's so many wonderful ambiguities in, in this, this book, but there's also a question of, is he, he might be saying to her, he might be saying, I mean, he's, he's clearly tried to sort of substitute his former set of beliefs with a belief that she's able to save him with, with a new savior. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it might be just exactly as you say, Dave, that he's, she, he's showing her that she kind of, so there you, you refuse to, to get out of your cold, hard legal world and save me and engage with me and look, this is what happened. Or it might be his return. There's that, that poem that he sends her that mm -hmm. she tries to piece out it might actually be a genuine return on his part to the religion in which he was raised with his ability to say, this is my choice. I really was able to choose this. I've had time to think about it. I've been out in the world a bit and now this is my choice. I, I see that both Barry and, and Nathan have responses as well. <laughs> I, I thought it was the, the I, I, I thought it was ambiguous, but I did not think I thought there was a childishness to it that was easy to read as guilt because, and again, you know, this whole, this creature is a child. He acts, I mean, particularly after we see him, you know, drenched in that, you know, we know, uh -huh. but I, you know, I think that I felt that this was a child who wanted to be saved. And if he was going to be saved, if he wasn't going to be saved by her, by her, yeah, he needed to be saved by something someone else and i think i mean i guess that's the thing that's really complicated about the book that i like where where you know again it, it certainly we have feelings about religion in this book mr McEwen, but we are it is they are not necessarily so clear cut you know this these this is complicated and maybe the choice that he made at the end the last choice is the right one for him you know so I, I, yeah, I loved that it was that, that, I mean, this is the greatest book club book, right? Because you can discuss about what did you think the ending meant? Exactly. Like, yeah. All you exactly. want in a book club book. <laughs> well, I so want to thank you all for being with me today. It's just been a wonderful discussion. Naomi Khan, Nathan Hensley, and Barry Hardiman. Thank you all for such a great discussion. One of the best, really. Thank you. Thank Thanks you so much. much. Thanks that for was the so satisfying. I know. Oh, good. <laughs> Keep it going. I love it. This good. Is thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Bye bye. Bye. And before you go, I must say I hated for that discussion to have to end, but we do have to end it. Before you go, please take a minute to fill out a short survey about this event that's going to pop up on the screen. And let me tell you, our next book club meeting will be Wednesday, June 29. We're going to talk about the Book Thief by Marcus Zusak. The book was an international sensation. It spent nearly 10 years on the New York Times bestseller list. The panel discussion will then be followed by an interview with the author himself, Marcus Zusak, He'll be joining us from his home in Australia, getting up very early in the morning to be with us. So watch your inbox for more details. Our book club is produced by Allison Brody. Kellen Quigley is our engineer today. Yan Ling Zhang is our events coordinator, 
And of course, we couldn't have done this discussion without the support of Verandra Silva, Julia Slattery, Lynn Kronberger, Brian Colombo, James Coates, Lauren Centrella, and Michelle Morgan. And of course, a very special thank you to each and every one of you who joined us today. I'm Diane Rehm. I look forward to seeing you next month.